Steve McQueen was and is the definition of cool. The foundation of his iconic coolness was actually laid down during the Western television series called Wanted, Dead or Alive. That series ran from 1958 to 1961, and it basically made the actor a household name. With his trusty, fancy weapon and his cowboy swagger, McQueen's version of the bounty hunter, Josh Randall, made a great hero for all of the viewers watching TV during this time. You see, bounty hunter Josh Randall first appeared on another western, and that was the Robert Culp western called Trackdown. He was a Texas ranger who patiently rolled his own cigarettes. And Culp's character was the forerunner of the cool cowboy that's been perfected by Steve McQueen and Clint Eastwood. McQueen actually appeared again on the series track down that same season, playing dual roles. He played the brothers Mal and Wes Cody. Wanted Dead or Alive appeared on CBS during all its seasons, and it was produced in black and white. Steve McQueen's character of Josh Randall is a Confederate veteran bounty hunter with a really soft heart. He often donates his earnings to the needy and helps his prisoners if they've been wrongly accused. Now, although he is a bounty hunter, he doesn't chase and capture only men that are on wanted posters. He also goes about settling family feuds, and he frees people that are unjustly jailed. Just almost anybody that has a need, he comes to the aid of them. All of these variety of people that he helps in their pursuit of justice, and not just for the money involved, is one of the reasons that the show was so attractive and popular to so many viewers. During the first few episodes at the beginning of the series, Steve McQueen actually rides a really energetic horse that's named Ringo. And several of the episodes in 1960 included a sidekick named Jason Nichols, played by Wright King. He was a deputy sheriff that had turned bounty hunter. He and Randall worked together on the screen with a great chemistry that many of the viewers just loved to see. They really clicked. By the start of the third season, Nichols had been dropped. And it's kind of confusing on why that character was actually dropped out of the plot of the series. In the episode called The Partners, that's an episode where Nichols actually does away with three men that Randall felt should have been taken alive. So most of the viewers consider that as an episode that really broke up their partnership. But that wasn't the case at all because that was only the second episode with Wright King, and that was long before the last episode that he ever appeared in. Initially, the creators of the series really had a hard time selling the show, because bounty hunters at that time were thought of to be some pretty unsavory characters, because they had been portrayed as such in numerous westerns and movies. So in order to overcome this, the creators of the show decided to throw a little kink into the plan, or actually a gratuity, which made Josh Randall give most or sometimes all of his earnings to help the people that he was surrounded by and working for. By doing this, the creators of the show created this character to be very sympathetic and a likable character. It completely changed the equation of the bounty hunter. Now, Steve McQueen has an obvious way in these westerns to try to upstage people, or at least that's the perception of it. What he does is he touches his hat while somebody else is having dialogue in a scene and is actually supposed to be the point of interest in a shot. By him touching his hat... This draws attention to him. This was something that he used in The Magnificent Seven numerous times and irritated some of his co-stars on the set. 
Now let's talk about the gun he uses. Everybody knows about the mare's leg weapon that Josh Randall carries. And it's a cut down Winchester model 1892 carbine that's a 4440 caliber. But what you need to notice is that the bullets that he carries on his cartridge belt are not the same bullets that would be used in the gun. The bullets on his cartridge belt are a 4570 caliber. These were used for larger, more powerful rifles of the day. The producers wanted to use the 4570s because they were just visually more impressive than the relatively small pistol size rounds that are actually used in the 1892 carbine. Now the use of this gun is kind of crazy to start with because the gun is an 1892 and the series is set in the 1870s. Now there were two different themes that were played during the series. The music that was heard in the first season was replaced later on with a more brassy sounding version. The earliest version was composed by William Luce while Herschel Burke Gilbert wrote the latter music for the show. At one point in the series, bounty hunter Randall has to bring in Santa Claus. On Christmas Eve, he receives his most dawning assignment yet from a young boy who has eight cents to pay in reward. He wanted Santa Claus brought in. He gets tricked into the job, and he tries to make the best of a bad situation for the sake of the boy's family and the boy. This episode is really great and it has a great twist at the end. It's definitely one of my favorite. Now a few times Steve McQueen has actually commented that these were tough years that he did on this series. But he did state that he learned his trade there and he believed that it made him more disciplined as an actor. But that doesn't mean that while he was on the show that he didn't want out of it. He initially took the role because he was really concerned that his movie career was just not going anywhere. After he got the role and became popular, he started getting movie offers everywhere. And this is where he really wanted to be. He wanted to be a film star, not a TV star. He was itching so bad to take his career to the big screen, that when he was offered the job on the Magnificent Seven, and he couldn't get out of the commitment that he had to wanted dead or alive, he was just not willing to pass up that role. He did kind of a crazy stunt, but it must have worked. He ended up taking a rented Cadillac and ran it into the Bank of Boston, and he did this intentionally so that he could actually fake an injury to get out of production on Wanted Dead or Alive. He showed up to the set with a neck brace, and this forced a delay in production and allowed him to go shoot the film. What I've always wondered about this statement, and I've read this for years, is the fact that they knew he went somewhere to do a film. I don't know why they didn't try to take legal action against him, but they didn't. Now, after the series was completely wrapped and it was over, it said that Steve McQueen danced a jig to celebrate. Steve McQueen was just glad that he had done his last scene on the set of Wanted Dead or Alive. And he wanted no possibility of a door being left open for a potential revival of the series. Now, it's kind of hard to find this in syndication, if you look on YouTube, you can find where people have uploaded some episodes and they've made some terrible edits to the episodes trying to avoid the YouTube copyright claims that would definitely be incurred by anybody uploading this series that didn't own the rights to it. But to look for it in a legal form on one of the platforms that you can download is pretty hard. I wanted to watch some episodes and had trouble finding them. This is a great show, and after doing my research, I think the Inspiration Channel actually has this listed in their programming guide. So if you want to check that out, you might really enjoy 
rewatching something that put Steve McQueen on the map. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.